We're going to finish up this series today, a series that has been one of my favorite series that I've ever done, honestly. I hope that you've enjoyed it. If, if not, if this is your first week, this is your, uh, you know, first time clicking in, that's totally okay as well. Each week is a different story. The series is called Deus Ex Machina, and that's a, that's a theater term. It's a Greek term, really, that means God from the machine. And so back hundreds of years ago, when you would go to the movies, for instance, uh, it was actually a, a play. And so there would be a play writer kind of writing the play as the crowd would watch. And if the play writer couldn't get the main character out of a problem, you know, he wrote himself into a hole, he couldn't get the main character out, they would have a deus ex machina on the standby behind the curtain, and they would hit a button, and this, this hero would just come and save the day and set the plot back where it needed to go. And, and so we are looking at stories in the Bible where this has happened, where God has just showed up on the scene unexpectedly, uh, surprisingly, out of nowhere. We're calling it kind of the subtitle, God's Sudden and Surprising Solutions. And I'm finding now in life that when it comes to God, when it comes to theology and religion, that we need more than an explanation, right? We need an explanation. Somebody, I needed somebody to help me understand, you know, all of this when I first kind of was, was introduced to God and, and church and all of this stuff was new to me. But, but an explanation can never take the place of an experience. It never can. It'd be like trying to tell somebody, if you got family from out of state, trying to explain to them how beautiful Pensacola Beach is. It's just hard to do. There's no way to explain it. I mean, you've, you've seen it, but you just can't really get the full effect of it until you experience it. And so this whole series has been built around that right there, that God cannot be fully understood until he's experienced we need, a, we need an experience with God. I'm, I'm thankful for explanations. And every week I do my best to try to put some sound theology and doctrine to put in your hands that are gonna, that's going to help you tomorrow morning. That's practical. And I'm thankful for that. But I don't want you to get to where you're, you're coming to church because of that. <laughs> you know, well, what is, you know or, or, or because of the information that we're coming to church. We're getting out of bed on a rainy Sunday morning and we're clicking online and we're watching this for more than just information, we can get information all day long, right? Information is, is we've never had more access to information than we've had now. People are drowning in information, but they're dying for wisdom. And you can have all the information in the world, and we've got it really now, but it's wisdom that we need. And I think that only comes through experiences. And this is our theme verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is the message, this is a paraphrased version. And this has been my prayer, this is, this is really the goal of this series. This is what I want all of us to experience, that when we t when, whenever though they, that's me and you, he's talking about me and you, when we turn our faces to God, as Moses did, God removes the veil, and there they are face to face. They suddenly recognize that God is alive. He's, he's a personal presence. He's not law. He's not religion. He's not this chiseled stone. He's not a building. He's alive. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We're free of it, all of us. Nothing between us and God anymore. Our faces shining with the brightness of his face. That's, that's good. That means the closer I get to God, the more I begin to look like God. And that's our prayer. That's what we want. And so we are transfigured, much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and brighter, more beautiful as God enters our lives, and we become more like him. Amen. Can I get one good amen? If you want that in your life, just say a great big amen. Okay, and, and so when I start off on series like this, again, I, I really had a different series plan. I'll just go through and, and research it as much as I can, and I look at every, I'll try to, like for, for this series, Deus Ex McKenna, I want to look at every encounter that a person has had with God. I want to look at them and read about them and see if there, is there a pattern there, And because I'm finding that God, he, he's put patterns in the, in the Word. There's patterns there. There's things that have happened, and they happen more than once, 
and there's, it, it's this pattern that begins to emerge. It's what we would call like the, the lowest common denominator, right? When you take a number and you cut it down and you divide it and you try to get to the one thing that all numbers have in common, that lowest common denominator. And so there's, there's patterns. The Lord's Prayer, there's a pattern. It's more than just a prayer. It's a, there's a pattern there. There's requests. There's worship. There's a pattern there. In, in the book of Psalms, it's pretty amazing this guy named Walter Brueggemann, he, he broke down, he's, a, he's an Old Testament scholar, and he broke down every psalm into three categories. He, there is a pattern in the book of Psalms. Psalms of orientation, which are psalms of order. Psalms of disorientation, where is Psalm 22? Um, my God, why have you forsaken me? My world's falling apart, Lord, where are you at? I need some help. Can a brother get some help down here, right? So when things are falling apart, and then psalms of reorientation. That's where God starts putting the pieces back together. The storm's over, the sun's out, I'm assessing the damage, and now I'm starting to rebuild. Psalm 23 has all three of those in it. The Lord is my shepherd, that's, he's bringing things together. If I, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, why am I going through this disorientation? And then surely goodness and mercy. Finally, David looked back on his life and he's seen God was there the whole time. There's patterns. With this particular series, and when God shows up in a person's life, there's three things that I'm seeing that always happen. And we've studied jo Jacob, his, his encounter with God, and we looked at Joseph's encounter with God last week. We looked at Moses' encounter with God. But if you look at, if you look at all the encounters with, uh, with God that we see in the New Testament and the Old Testament, there's always three things that happen in these people's lives, when they see God, when they have this great vision in their life, and they always have the same purpose. It's amazing to me that when God shows up, when God reveals himself, when God does something great, when there's a real revival on the planet, it's different. It, there, God has a, there's a mission, right? When God shows up, it's more than just that he wants, you know, wants everybody to have a good time, maybe shout a little bit, we'll have some concessions, make a little money, and then, and then we'll move on. If you study the great revivals, which I did when I, I was infatuated by them when I first became a Christian, the Welch revival, when it hit, the police would walk around and, because people were just laid out everywhere, and it was a college campus where it started. And so to find out if the person was drunk or a part of the revival, the police would smell their breath. And if they didn't smell alcohol, they left them on the ground because they knew he was, he was at Finney's meeting. But if they had alcohol in their breath, they pulled him to the meeting. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, uh, and so when God showed up, people changed. Things happened. Communities were changed. God showed up with a message and a mission for the person. It wasn't so that we could shout around and have, you know, a, a, a doodads and an experience with God that we could argue with other people about. It was, it was never about that. It was always about the mission. In Isaiah, the, this, this, this encounter we're going to read about today, Isaiah's encounter was exactly the same. Pretty amazing encounter. And just, just so that we can, uh, just to give you a little history here, and I'm going to go through this Isaiah 6. There's eight verses we're going to cover, and then we're going to pray. And in these eight verses, I'm going to show you these three things that every single encounter in the Bible has in common. And when God speaks in your life, because he is, and he, he already has, I'm sure, when he does, there's, there's three different stages of it. There's three different scenes that we walk through. And for Isaiah, this is how it started. Verse 1, Isaiah chapter 6. He starts it off within the year King Uzziah died. And so he gives you, you know, and, and reading this story or reading this first line, I would just buzz right through that normally. So he's given us a historical context on when this happened. But uh, there's a little bit more to it. King Uzziah has an important role to play in what happened with this Isaiah. Because King Uzziah, little did I know, anybody have a 16-year-old in here? Anybody? A few of y'all got here? Okay, so... King Uzziah became king at 16 years old. And so he was the king of Judah. He became king at a very early age. Didn't know this as well. Isaiah and Uzziah were second cousins. Uzziah was an incredible king. It says, there's just going to give you a few things that this 16-year-old king did, King Uzziah. In his 52-year reign, the Philistines were completely subdued by King Uzziah. He took the army and the nation of, 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 the, of the tribe of Judah, and he took the army to, he built it to the largest army they'd ever had, 310,000 men. I mean, this guy 
had it going on. Not only that, he established settlements in their territory. So he bought more land. He expanded Judah. It became larger. He, 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 he brought in foreign relations. So everybody loved King Uzziah. He developed domestic projects. Not only that, he was a national hero. The people of Judah looked to him as their king. They looked to him for security. They looked to him for help. They looked to him. He had all the solutions. And up until that point, King Uzziah was an incredible king. And then he started well, but it didn't end that way. Let me give you this verse right here. It says that 2 Chronicles chapter 26, Uzziah became powerful. His pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to God. He entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. And so when Isaiah, if you can read between the lines, when Isaiah starts off this chapter in the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah was his source of security. King Uzziah was his way into the temple to do what he thought at the time God had called him to do. King Uzziah was his source of of resources like to supplies like what he needed to do and so when he says the year king uzziah died basically what he's saying the year that my life fell apart i saw the lord and so you insert whatever you need to insert right there for isaiah it was when for me it was when i lost my job or when i got that phone call when year 2020 hit, March, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like everybody's going to be able to say that. In the year 2020, I saw the Lord. I saw something crazy. I don't know if it was God or who, who was pulling. But, but I, I, oftentimes, every single encounter that someone sees God, the ones that we've encountered, the ones that we've studied so far, if you look at the first common denominator, there's always a crisis something bad happens for isaiah his the president died literally this was the greatest this was the greatest king they had seen up until that point isaiah was in his cabinet he was cousins with them things were rolling just like he wanted it and then it stopped and it was in that moment that isaiah sees God. So for Jacob, it's the same thing. Jacob had been running his whole life and he, his brother was coming to kill him. Moses was comfortable. He was running. He had murdered somebody. It was all crisis. You look at Joseph. Joseph, it was a crisis. It was trouble. And we run. We, I mean, we teach our kids to stay out of trouble, right? <laughs> we want, like, I feel like all I do sometimes, I have a four-year-old, I feel like all I do is say no, 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 right? Don't do that. No, no. We want to keep our kids out of trouble. But I'm noticing a theme here that, if, that God normally shows up when there's trouble. And I'm finding in life that there's some people that find trouble and then there's some people that trouble just finds them. And whatever your story may be, you may have found the trouble yourself or the trouble may have found you. Trouble oftentimes precedes God showing up on the scene. And I think the best pastoral advice I've ever been given is this right here. Don't wait for a crisis to look for God. (laughs) Don't wait for a crisis to start looking to see if God's been speaking because he's normally been speaking the whole time. But we don't stop to listen until King Uzziah died. Whatever that blank may seem like. And so there's three things. There's a pattern here. The first one is this. If I really want to hear from God I, I, and I want, I want to experience God, I have to, I have to take this to heart. I have to believe this, that God wants to rescue me. God wants to rescue you. That when trouble comes, it comes with a purpose. Every time. Because oftentimes we pray, for, we, pray for, we pray for a harvest and God sends the rain. Come on, somebody. We, we pray for God to increase, but then he, he sends something. He answers with something we don't want. But we have to know that every time that trouble comes, that every time that rain comes, that, that God always has a way of escape. That God always has a point. God always has a purpose in it. And so he's either going to rescue me out of the trouble or he's going to rescue me through the trouble. But you got to believe in your heart of hearts that God wants to rescue you. And sometimes it takes 
it takes a shaking for us to turn to God. I know that's how it is for me. If, if my story, I mean, it was, I, I hit rock bottom and then I dug a little more, right? And if anybody's like that, if, you, if you're hard-headed, some people's rock bottoms are different. And, and we don't ask for help or we don't ask, cry out to God until we're really, really, really at the end of our rope. J.K. Rowling, I believe is her name, she wrote the, the books. There's a really popular series that she wrote and you could look it up and you're probably really familiar with it. But it's, it's, it's really popular now. But when she wrote it, she was a single mom living on welfare and she had nothing. And there's a quote that I love by her. She says, you know, it was rock bottom when I hit rock bottom for me was when I started building the foundation that my life is built on now. And oftentimes when God wants to speak to us, he'll strip stuff away. If you look at Job, he took everything from Job. And if you look at the different stories, and, and, and I'm just, my name is Nathan Pooley, and I'm your friend. I love you. I just want you to know that. But I want to be real with you so you know if you're, going, if you're in trouble right now, I want you to hear this. There's hope. You're in a good place. If you're in trouble right now, if you're facing something that's bigger than you have the resources to fix, you're in a good place to hear from God. If there's a mountain that you're in front of that's so insurmountable and you've tried everything you know to try, and you, you, if apart from God, you're not going to get through it, you're in a good place. Because God likes to rescue his people. Psalm 116 verse 6 says it like this, the Lord protects the ones that are unwary. He, 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 when I was brought low, David said, he, he saved me. That when I, was, when I was at the point where I thought I had no way out, God showed up on the scene. And I love how often, you know, God will do this, and he does it in different ways for different people. But God will let us get to the end. He'll let us try all of our different ways out. He'll let us try all of our solutions. And he'll let us get to the end of our rope where it seems like every single other way is exhausted. And I've argued with God about that before. Anybody else? Like, Lord, why do you got to wait till it gets to, I mean, can't, can't we just, can't it just happen like now? Right? We live in this uh, drive through society. I want to order at this window. I want to pick it up at that window. And I want it in less than five minutes. Right? I want it quick, 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 quick. And sometimes God will wait and he'll wait and he'll wait and he'll wait. David Wilkerson, incredible pastor from New York, he called it the death of a promise. One of the best messages I've ever heard. And that a lot of times God will give you a promise and then it'll look like the promise has died. And he'll do that. He'll make us wait. Why? Because he wants to be our deus ex machina. He wants to show up. And when God makes a way, there's going to be no person that can take the credit for it. I think that's why he does it. He doesn't want us to, he, he wants to, us to know that, that it was him and him the whole time. That God showed up on the scene. He wants to rescue us. He wants to be our rescuer. Sometimes the most powerful prayer that we can pray is just, Lord, help me. Peter gets out of the boat. He's walking on water, right? He walks on water twice is the way I say. Everybody says, well, he sank. No, he walked on water twice. And all he had to say the second time was, Lord, help me. You know, sometimes it's just that quick prayer, and it makes all the difference that God will reach down. And, and so Isaiah, he sees the Lord. And what does he see? Let's, let's read it together. It's important because it was in the middle of this crisis that God shows up. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. It's important, the vision that, that Isaiah sees here. God is seated on a throne. I like that. He's seated. He's not upset. Come on, somebody, right? Isaiah is panicking. His whole world is upside down. His president, his king is now dead. He doesn't know what's happening, and God's just seated on the throne. Come on, right? It, it's a picture here that this hasn't taken God by surprise. Isaiah's world is in chaos, but God is in order, right? This, this God, is he's, seat, he's seated. This has not taken him by surprise. High and exalted. This is the vision Isaiah is seeing. And the train of his robe filled the temple. What does that mean? Well, in that day, the king, the power of the king was demonstrated by the length of his robe. And so when they would go in and they would subdue a country or a nation, they would, they would take the robe of that king and add it to the king's other, his robe, when he would when he would conquer another uh, country or another civilization. And so Isaiah sees his king, and he sees his king who is so bad to the bone, right? 
his, the train of his robe fills the entire temple. It means that he subdues the whole world, that he's seated on, he's, he, his vi- if you see what's going on, his vision of God is changing. Above him were seraphs. This is getting crazy now. Each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. Imagine telling that story at Thanksgiving. Hey, Aunt Julie, I had a vision this morning. Let me tell you about it. There were seraphs, and with six wings, everyone's was saying, he, he's, he's gotten a hold of some stuff over at college. Y'all need to check his bags. Somebody, he's, he's eating the, those wacky mushrooms or something. He's having visions. And they were calling to one another. So now the angels are talking to each other. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. What's amazing is this same vision. Revelation 4 and 5, exactly the same. Same vision. Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, if you want to go back and read it. Exact same vision. And I think the, the, the purpose is, is this is the pattern here. That when God shows up, when God shows up in your life the way that he's done with me, and I know that he's done it with so many people, the second thing that he begins to do, the purpose of the visit, it's like when granddad comes over to visit, right? Caitlin's grandfather, I love Caitlin's grandfather. He's, he's um, Lord, he's in his 90s. And when he comes down and sits with you, there's a reason. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if Grant, like there's, he's got something to say, and he may have been thinking about it for a full year. You know what I mean? Like, like, and so you listen. And God, I think God is the same way. When he, when he shows up on the scene, he's got something he needs to say to you. He wants to reveal himself. And so Isaiah, Isaiah's world fall apart, his world fell apart, and he looks up and he sees God, and then God starts giving him this revelation. He sees the Lord in this temple. His train is, is his, his authority. It's a king like he's never seen before. He's cousins with King Uzziah. King Uzziah is probably one of the most powerful kings on the planet at the time, but the king that he's looking at, he's never seen a king like this. And I'm finding that sometimes when we have our hope in the wrong place, that God will remove things in our life so that we can see him better. If we have our hope in a job, God may move that job out of our life. Why? Not so that we can flounder around and be unemployed, because he wants us to see him. We may have our hope in, in it. There, there may be something in our life that we look to for security apart from God. And when that begins to happen, one of God's way of helping us see him clearer and see him as the, the unseen king, right? The king of kings is he'll move around and he'll reorder our lives and he'll take the stuff that we thought was certain and show us that it's just sinking sand. King Uzziah is dead. But God filled the gap with himself. And so whatever your blank is, I want you to know that God will fill the gap with himself. Whatever we tend to trust in, whatever we tend to look to as our source of security, God's saying, I want you to see now, it, it, it may come through somebody, but I want you to see me as the source. And that's what he begins to, he begins to enlarge his view of God. Isaiah has this vision of God like he's never seen. He begins to see God for himself. He begins to see God in new ways. And I'm, I'm, I'm seeing now that the, mo- the more, the bigger God begins to get in our life, the smaller our ego becomes. And it, I want you to see what happens. I want you to see what happens with Isaiah. Verse 4, he sees God, and then, and then the sound of their voices, the doorposts, the threshold shook, the temple was filled with smoke, and he says, woe is me. He, he cried. He said, I am, I am ruined. Basically, he starts disqualifying himself from what he was seeing. Saying, there's, there's no way that, that I, I'm confused. I don't really know what's happening. I don't really know what I'm seeing right now. And I think that's the, that's the real adventure in life. I think life gets, it can get boring when it gets predictable. Everything gets boring when it gets predictable. A job gets boring when it gets predictable. A relationship gets boring when it gets predictable. A church gets boring when it gets predictable. And there's one thing certain about God is he is unpredictable. 
and God wants to reveal himself. He, there's so much to God, and he, he wants us to go on this journey of just searching for him and knowing him more. And I think when we lose our sense of wonder, when we lose our sense of awe, when we get to the point and we say we know everything and we've arrived at the top, I think it's Leonard Ravenhill. He said, serving God is like climbing Mount Everest. And as soon as you think you're at the pinnacle, the clouds part, and there's 6,000 more feet to climb. God wants to reveal himself to you. And I think part of this is that we never stop pursuing him. He wants to, he wants to no matter if I'm six years old or I'm 600 years old, there's more of God that I haven't seen. There's more of God that I don't know. And I think that's what we're going to be doing in heaven for, for a long time, is that we're going to be learning more of, of who God is, of him revealing himself to us in ways that we never thought or never knew. And, and, the, and the first reaction I think we have when God does something new in our life is a sense of guilt. This sense of, whoa, hang on, I don't, I don't know, I'm uncomfortable with that. That's what happened with Isaiah. He, he, he drew back. He, he said, I, I don't know if I'm able to handle this. And sometimes the best thing that can happen to us in our life is that something will come and humble us. And this vision of God humbled Isaiah. It humbled Isaiah. And I think that the more that we see God, the, the, the bigger God gets in our life, our ego begins to get smaller. And that's why I think this is so important. That when we see God, when God shows up, it, 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 not only does it humble us, but it also it kind of takes our hands off the steering wheel. It reminds us that, you know, not everything that happens in my life is up to me. That there is a higher power at play. There, there is a God who is seated on the throne and that at his word, all, everything in my life can just change in a moment. God wants to reveal himself to me and to you. And that's what he did with Isaiah and that's what he did with Jacob and that's what he did with Moses. And this is the reason why. There's three things. God, she res he wants to rescue us. And in that moment of rescue, he reveals himself. But there's always a purpose to it. And that's how you know when there's a real, like when there's a real, when God is showing up in a person's life, like when God is really moving in someone's life, you're going to know based on, Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Things are going to begin to change. What may have been a, a, a fruit, a, a tree that hadn't bared fruit in years is starting to come to life. There's something new about the person. There's something new. There, there's, there's, there's something happening. God, I can see God in this person's life. And so when God shows up, he shows up with a message. He shows up with a mission. And that's exactly what he does for Isaiah. I want you to see this in the last two verses here. God shows up on the scene. He rescues Isaiah. He reveals himself to him, and then he gives him a mission. He says, I heard the voice of the Lord. And this is what it said, whom shall I send? Verse 8, and who will go for us? And this was Isaiah's response. Here I am, Lord, right? Send me. And what I love about this, and it's so important, is that Isaiah, you know, in, in, my, in my Bible, it's over this chapter 6, it says Isaiah's commission. Like, like it's... Like almost like this was Isaiah's commissioning into ministry. But Isaiah's commission into ministry happened in chapter 1. And, and I, I want you to see that Isaiah, at this point in his life, he's lived a little while. He's made some mistakes. The path that he thought he was going to take to God's plan has now been shut down because King Uzziah... His whole world is now, I mean, and so what I want you to see, what God begins to do with Isaiah is, is Isaiah sees his life and everything he's done up to, to that point as disqualifying him from God ever using his life again. That's what he begin, That's the conversation we're seeing. He, he says, God, I'm a man of unclean lips. Lord, you see who my family is? He starts going through his family line. You see who my dad is and my grandpa? You know, like he, he starts just giving all these reasons why God has picked the wrong person. And I'm finding now that, that it's amazing how God will use the very thing that we feel like will disqualify us from 
from God's work. He will use that as the very heart of what he's called us to do. I'm finding it's people that have been through divorces that are the best healers when it comes to helping somebody who's been through a divorce. I'm finding that somebody who's been addicted and knows what it's like to have their life taken from them and struggled and struggled and fought with it for so long and couldn't get over it, that those are the people that God will say, I want you to go and help addicts. It's the people that fight with depression that knows what it's like to wake up on a sunny Sunday morning and it looks like this right here and you can't get out of bed and you don't know what to do and, 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 and has felt the weight of it. The Bible calls Jesus our kinsman redeemer. That word kinsman means he's like me and he's like you. And a lot of times God will call us to be kinsmen redeemers. And so he lets us go through trouble and he lets us go through addiction. And he lets us get a divorce and he lets people walk out on us and he lets people lie about us and hurt us. And he lets us walk through things, not because he wants to hurt us, but because he wants to give you a message. He wants to use it. And he wants to recommission your life. That's what he does. He recommissions our life. Isaiah was commissioned in chapter 1, but this was Isaiah's recommissioning. This was Isaiah's, this, uh, it didn't happen the way Isaiah thought it was going to happen. And at this point in Isaiah's life, he thought for sure the plan God had for me is now over because Uzziah was my, my, the key to all this working. And God says, no, it wasn't. <laughs> No, it wasn't. And I'm going to tell somebody in here, I think this is, this is your morning for a recommissioning. That, that maybe you've, you've given up on some things or maybe you've disqualified yourself. And, and God has you here and God has you listening to this right now because he has a mission and a purpose. You're still breathing. I know God has a purpose for your life because your heart is beaten. <laughs> and if you can hear this right now, God has something for you to do. And in part of seeing God and having this vision of God and knowing God deeper is going to come connected directly to what you do with what he's, he's commissioned you to do. I wanted you to see what this recommission means. It means to give a new commission, to validate an existing commission, or to put back in service. I believe that's what God wants to do. I believe that's what God wants to do. And this is, this is how he does it. We're gonna, I'm going to ask the band to come up. And you've probably noticed that these services have been a little bit shorter, and I've done that on purpose. Because these, these services are not really about information. And I want to give you information, and I hope you're taking notes. And thank you for doing that. But I really, the, the goal of these services, and really every week, every week, is not to give you some new information. And I want to do that. But, but the prayer is that at some point in this service, if you're watching online, if you're outside, if you're in here, that at some point God speaks to your life. He speaks into your life, and it may come through a person. It may come through somebody shaking your hand. Somebody may give you a word of encouragement. It may come during a service, during a, a song, and you just feel like that lyric was for you. It's amazing to me. One of the things that I used to do before, uh, you know, before March I would go, I loved, I loved shaking people's hands. I loved hugging people. I'm not just, I just like to, I like to meet with people face to face. I'm kind of old fashioned. I like to just see how people are doing. I feel like that, I love Zoom. Zoom's awesome, but there's so much about a person you can't get if, if you're not seeing into their eyes and you're there with them. And I just like doing that. It's hard to do that now. But it was amazing to me after services, what people would tell me they heard and I would go back and listen. It's like, seriously, I would go back, I'd listen, and it was painful because I hate watching myself. But, I, but they would say things like, when, when you said this, it was just, it's what I needed. I didn't say it. And that's happened more than once. I'm talking dozens of times. And people would walk out and they would hear, and the miracle of preaching is not the person. The miracle happens between the mic and your ears. When the Holy Spirit puts exactly in your heart what you need to hear and, what, what, and you're receiving and, and you're taking notes and I'm talking about Isaiah, but you're writing down notes about Jacob because that's what, the whole, that's what God is giving you. He's wanting to speak into your life and he does that on a personal way and it's more than just information. It's personal. It's different, I think, almost for every person. 
And so this is what I want us to do as we close out this series. I want us just to let's stand together if we can. And, and I want us to bow our heads and we're gonna pray this morning. And I'm gonna have our, our team come down to the front, our prayer team. We're gonna sing one last song together. And my prayer is that as we worship, that God would just speak to us. And if you're here today, and you're carrying around guilt and you're carrying around shame. I believe that this message, Isaiah, you know, Isaiah had made some mistakes, but what I'm seeing with every person that we've studied up until this, to this Sunday, Moses, Moses was a murderer. He was a convicted murderer. God used Moses. Jacob was, his name meant deceiver. He lied his whole life. Joseph was, you know, he was kind of the golden boy. That's why he got thrown in the pit, but he had made some mistakes. Everybody has. And what's beautiful is God uses those mistakes, and that's what, that's what becomes our message. That's what God will use to help so many other people if we can push through it, if we can complete the pattern. Let God rescue you. Let God heal you. Let God reveal himself to you. Show you that he's a loving father, that he wants to use your life to make a difference. And then let him recommission you. Because what he has, you may not make as much money, but I can promise you, you'll have more purpose. And you'll have more meaning. Let him take your life. Let me, I'm going to read this verse. It's the last verse. I, it's the, I put it in the last slide. If you can throw it up there, guys. This is, this is the prayer I want us all to pray. Embrace what God does for you. It's the best thing that you can do for him. The, the, the slide before that. How do we do that? We lay down our everyday life. One more slide up. Lay down our everyday life, ordinary life, our sleeping, our eating, and we lay it down at his feet. Walking around life, we place it before God as an offering, and that's where God does his best work. And so let's just do that now. Father, we come to you. We lay our ordinary life down at your feet because all these men that we've studied that had incredible counter encounters with God they were ordinary men Moses was a shepherd Jacob was the same these were all ordinary men just like us ordinary women and had these incredible encounters with God and so Lord we just open our heart to you now we open our minds our spirits to you we ask that you would speak to us in Revelation we talked about, Lord, that, that, that we would have eyes to see, ears to hear what you would say to your church. And Lord, we believe that you're speaking now more than ever. And so we just ask that you would speak into our lives today. Let us know, God, that you're going to rescue us. If you're in trouble right now, you're listening to this. If you're here, you're in trouble right now. I want, however you can, just signal to heaven. Let God know, I need some help. I need, I, need some, I need some help. If that's just a lifted hand, if that's just looking up, if that's just praying a little prayer, but Lord, I just need, I need some help right now. I'm in something I don't know how to get out of. Reveal yourself to me. Show me, Lord, that you make a way. Show me, Lord, that you make ways where there seems to be no way. Show me, Lord, that you always step in. Reveal yourself to me and give me a mission. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.